You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me today on the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to welcome Julie Clark back to the show. She was on uh, a couple of years ago talking about The Last Flight, uh, a book that we absolutely loved, and uh, apparently everyone else in the world loved it as well. And Julie is here today to talk about writing thrillers and great mysteries and her brand new book, the lies I tell, um, Julie. I have to tell you when when I got the uh, the advanced reader copy from from your publisher, I dug into it and I, I knew it was going to be a book that I liked. I just didn't know that this was going to be a book that I loved so much. The characters just jump off the page, and uh, and we're going to get all into it in a minute. But there's there's one character in particular that I didn't want to like, and <laughs> and and you just you just made me want to root for her and I kind of felt bad for wanting to. And, 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 you know, that's the hallmark of a great book when, when you can take a character that you're maybe not supposed to like, and you can't help, but, but be on their side a little bit of uh, such a fun read. And, and we'll quit teasing the audience in just a minute. The lies I tell, um, go grab it. It's available everywhere. They welcome back to the show, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear you say that because that was exactly what I was going to <laughs> I read Meg um, to make her kind of live in that gray zone of morality. Oh, and it's so gray. <laughs> have you want her to succeed? Yes, yes. Um, and, and we'll get all into that in just a minute. But um, there, there's some um, some fun questions that we've been asking some people to to get some conversation started here lately. And one question that I love to ask people is, uh, Julie, is there a piece of writing advice that you have gotten from someone? Um, and and a lot of people have something that immediately jumps to mind. That one, uh, a piece of writing advice that you hold dear that that has been a, a big help to you, and that you reflect on. Um, often or is there a piece of writing advice that was so terrible that it's laughable at this <laughs> point do, do you have anything uh that sticks out to you um i always cite this phrase that i got in from a book that i read a long time ago on craft and the author is sandra schofield and the book is called the scene book s c e n e like as in a movie scene or a chapter scene sure and it basically, it was in her introduction, actually. Like, I didn't even get very far into the book until I was like, well, that was completely worth the money I spent on this book. Just this little piece of advice that I wrote on a note card and taped up next to my computer when I was just starting to write with the dream of publication someday. And it's pretty simple. It's two steps that will pretty much take you from aspiring writer to published writer. And that is number one, think of yourself as a worker. And number two, show up at the job. And that's it. That's all you need to do. And that was the best writing advice that I've ever seen anywhere that resonated with me. And every time I felt like, you know, this is just, I'm never going to get anywhere with this. No one's ever going to want to represent me or no one's ever going to want to buy this book or no one's ever going to want to read this book. If you think of yourself as a worker and you show up at the job every day, you will eventually get to a place where all of those things will happen. I love it. And I love that. Um, you know, there, there's so much magic um, that comes with writing that, you know, ideas just pop in from uh, from nowhere or from everywhere. And uh, there, there's so much serendipity that comes with writing. But um, there's also, uh, you know, this sense of, of being a craftsman and a craftsman shows up and works on his or her craft 
every day and gets better right. and better and better. And it's the it, it's that uncomfortable, uh, you know, walk between those two things and 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 acknowledging, you know, when the serendipity is real and also acknowledging when, uh, you know, butt in the chair is is the thing that gets you through the day to day. Yes. I mean, absolutely. You know, you can sit there and think about crafting beautiful sentences all day long. But if you're not sitting in that chair every day, they're only ideas. They're not actually anything that you're doing. Right. Exactly. Um, Julie, when did you know that you wanted to be um, a, a novelist and and not just, you know, as a kid thinking, oh, I want to I want to write stories one day. When did did you realize this is going to be something that I actually pursue? I'm going to I'm going to do the craft of it. And, you know, one day I'm going to get published. What, what was was there a, an awakening moment for you? Uh, I do think that when I was around 44, 45 or so, I really or maybe even like 43, um, I had been teaching for a number of years and I was feeling kind of like, you know, I mean, I can get by on a teacher's salary just fine, but it will always be something where I need to watch my pennies and make choices about where I shop. And, you know, and I thought, you know, a lot of a lot of my teacher friends have outside jobs besides teaching, like they work on the side as, you know, Pilates instructors or they work on the side at a bookstore or and I didn't really want to do any of those things. I'd always wanted to be a writer. I'd always wanted to write for publication. And my boys were really little at the time. They were probably in preschool and preschool in Los Angeles is very, very expensive. It is pretty much the cost of a one bedroom apartment. Um, and so it was really, it was really tight. And so I remember thinking, you know what, I'm going to, I've always wanted to write, so I'm going to write a book and then I'll sell the book and then I'll be able to pay for preschool. And that was really my goal of like just having enough money so that I wouldn't need to worry about whether I could pay my bills every month. And so that started me on the path of just like, I'm really going to do this. I, I've got to do this. I'm tired of living like this. I want to, I want to make some extra money. And, you know, I wasn't really thinking about writing and income in the sense like this will soon be my major source of income. I just wanted, I just wanted some breathing room, you know, um, a couple thousand dollars a month would have been just fine. And so I didn't realize how long it would take <laughs> to write a book, get published, even see any money at all. You know, by the time I actually published my first book in 2018, I was, you know, uh, my, my boys were in, you know, the fourth grade and this and the third and the second grade. And it was like, yeah, that's just, you know, so it was many years after preschool was over that I finally achieved my my goal of, of that. But but. You know, I, I don't I don't want to say that that took a long time because I think for a lot of people who have the goal of publication, it takes much, much longer than that. You know, some people are working at this for five, 10, 15 years. And so I feel very fortunate that it happened as quickly for me as it did within a matter of a few years. Right. Um, and now this is your third book that you published, right? Yeah, it is. So looking back at, at your catalog, um, the ones we choose that that first book that you published um, and and then um, with the, the last flight, which was right. the, the one we talked about last time. And now the lies I tell um, and I'm seeing an interesting um, growth trajectory from the ones we choose to the lies I tell. Now, the ones we choose was a was a magnificent book and it had some mysterious elements to it but i wouldn't call it a mystery no uh, no it was a straight up like women's fiction book. yeah yeah and 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 there were there were some um uh, uh like i said some mysterious elements there's a you know uh, a, a a connection there between yeah. the families and and there's some things that you have to kind of work out as you're reading uh, but then when you went to the last flight like that's a straight up like thriller mystery and now the lies i tell kind of goes even deeper into that territory um can first off um what made you fall in love with with mysteries and 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 thrillers was there uh, a, a book that you read uh or you know maybe a movie or something that really 
uh, or has this been a, a lifelong passion of yours? What, what really got you going on mysteries? Um, I, I don't know that it was really a conscious decision to jump from women's fiction over to thrillers. It was just, well, The Last Flight was a story that I was interested in writing, and I wanted to tell the story of a woman who wanted to disappear and vanish and to make the whole world think that she was dead so that she could get a fresh start as somebody else. Um, and my agent was the one that identified that as a thriller and said, so now you need to figure out how to write a thriller because right the way you've written it right now is as a women's fiction and it's not working. It needs to be a thriller. And so I had to go back and write it as a thriller. And, you know, I had some writer friends that cautioned me about jumping from women's fiction over to thriller because it's generally discouraged to trade, you know, to change genres so quickly right. as a writer. But, you know, the ones we choose um, it sold, but it didn't sell fantastically well. So I didn't have that many readers that that would have not wanted to jump over with me. And the other thing was that, you know, my agent, who is amazing and brilliant, and, you know, she just she has always maintained that, you know, um, that her writers just write whatever they want to write and let her worry about selling it. You know, like that's her job. It's not something for us to worry about. And it's really freeing to know that you have somebody in your corner who's like, nope, you do what you want to do. You tell the story that you want to tell, and then we will figure out how to market it, how to sell it, and where we want to position it. And, you know, I'll work with the publisher on that, and you just write stories. And that's really nice to have that sort of freedom, you know. Not everybody has that. Did you say that it was your agent that that told you that The Last Flight needed to be uh, written as a thriller? Yes, yes. So when when she gave you that advice um, and and said, you know, this is I, I, I get the kernel of the story that, that you're trying to tell, but mm -hmm. it's not working and it needs to you need to write it as this. Um, how did you go about, you know, um, kind of educating yourself on, on what makes a thriller and, and what were some of the uh, the hallmarks that, that you were that you had to change to. To, to make it fit into that genre. And then when you did, obviously it worked uh, because the last flight, you know, was, it you know, did, did amazingly well and is a fantastic book. So, so for, how did you identify what was wrong with it? And then, you know, by writing it as a thriller, what did that mean? Um, well, I mean, I talked to a lot of thriller writers. I, I have a lot of friends who write in the genre and they were all really, really helpful in kind of reading the manuscript and making suggestions. I read a lot of thrillers. Um, I just had to, you know, I think that when you have an understanding, once you start reading thrillers as, as a writer and trying to see how they work and how they're organized and how they're paced, um, you know, then you just go back to the beginning and start writing, you know, and, and you have the kernel of the story. And it's really just a matter of how you roll out the information that the reader needs. What do you withhold and when do you reveal it? So from the last flight where we we have two women and kind of the the gist of the story is that that someone wants to disappear um, right. To the lies I tell, one of the characters, it, kind of, her thing is kind of disappearing and and yeah. and you know recreating herself. Um, is there something here that you're trying to tell us, Julie? No, um, I think that I I think that with the last flight, the one thing that I found very compelling about the story was when Claire lands in Oakland, she realizes that Eva had died on the plane crash that she was supposed to be on and that Claire was essentially presumed dead by the entire world with Eva's identity in her purse, basically. I really liked the idea of her taking on someone else's identity and becoming somebody else and just sort of assuming that identity and moving forward. And while the story, in the story she does that to some extent, there was always a part of me that thought like, I think I could have taken that farther in a different direction and made it a little bit darker or a little bit more dangerous or a little bit more diabolical. And so the idea of assuming somebody else's identity kind of just stuck with me like a splinter until this book when I started thinking about how I wanted to write a story about a female con artist who basically does just that. She doesn't steal people's identities. She just makes them up and becomes other people so that she can con them out of whatever it is that she wants to con them out of. And, you know, the fun part was imagining her in lots of different roles. She's a dog walker. She's a college student. She's a life coach and interior decorator. 
Um, you know, she just does a lot of different kind of fuzzy jobs that, you know, you can say that you're accredited to do, for for example, that, you know, you're a life coach. It's not really something that you can check up on, right? Like, so somebody says they're a life coach and they've taken a course through, you know, XYZ organization. Like, it's, it's not, it's not exactly like, um, monitored, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a, there's a great line in the book, um, Meg says they're eager to believe whatever fantasy I feed them. Uh, on the surface, this book could have been a black and white, good versus evil story, um, but but you wouldn't let us uh, experience th- that this way, and and it probably wouldn't work the way it does if it would have just been a black and white, good versus evil. It's uh, there's a lot of gray in this book. Um, how did how did you come up with the characters of Meg and Cat? Well, I mean, I first want to say, like in real life, I don't think there is any anything that's truly good and anything that's truly evil. I think For that sure. it's solely in like movies and fairy tales. But I so I think that there are lots of morally gray people out there who who sometimes do the wrong thing for the wrong reasons, and some of them do the wrong thing for the right reasons. And Meg is of the latter, you know, she is out there doing bad things to people, but in her mind, she has reasons for why she's doing them. And they make sense to her and they make sense to the reader too. So even though the reader isn't necessarily agreeing with the choices she's making in the sense that they would say, yep, now I'm gonna go live my life that way too they understand her motivations they understand her backstory enough to know that this is what she needs to do and it makes sense to them and that's that's where i really that's really where i like my characters to go because what i always want is for my readers to experience life in ways that they would never actually go out and live themselves You know, like you're not going to meet somebody in the airport and trade a plane ticket with them like no one I know would ever, ever do that. But it sure is fun to watch somebody else do it. You know, it sure is fun to go and watch Meg con all of these people and, and be so smart about it and so cunning and wily that she gets away with it. It's fun. It's fun to watch. When when you started thinking about the book and and you know elements of it started coming together in your mind, um, what was the the first part of your planning process? Did did you start working out like all of Meg's different cons, um, her her different aliases? You know, Meg Williams, Maggie Littleton, Melody Wild. Um, did those things start coming together? Did you think about her foil cat? Um, c- kind of how it how did you structure it? Uh, in, in your planning phase, wh- how did the pieces start coming together? I saw it in three sort of chunks. And so what I wanted to do, and for a while I thought this could actually be three separate books, you know, mm. uh, where we're with Meg in the past for her very first con, the, way, the, the con that kind of turned her into a con artist. And then we're in Reading, Pennsylvania, where Meg has and that does another con and she gets kind of the last piece of the puzzle that she needs to know how to go back home and pull the big con that she's been waiting her whole life to pull on the man that she believes ruined her life and then the third con is that in real time like present time con on ron ashton who she believes you know stole her family home from out out from under her mother who then later died and left Meg alone, penniless, and sleeping in her car. So, um, you know, I, I did see it in those three very those those were the three cons that I that I wanted the reader to be alongside Meg for. Now there are lots of other cons that she pulls in between them, and we referenced them slightly in a little bit. Um, and some of them were in the book and then got pulled out of the book just for just for links. Um, but that was pretty much how I organized it in my head. And I knew that we'd be going back and forth. So we start in the present time where Meg is about to launch her last and final and biggest con. And then we go back in time and we're with her for the first con. And then we're back in the present time as Kat enters the story. And we see how Kat has her own areas of of trauma and 
you know, her desire to take Meg down. And then we go back in time with Meg to two years ago for that last con that put everything in place for her to come back and be successful here. So I knew it would be back and forth in time as well. By by having the character of Meg and uh, kind of showing some of her background so that we We kind of what what makes her who she who she is, and she's not just a a cardboard two dimensional um, you know grifter. Um, mm-hmm. w- were there ever times where um, um, how do I say this? Where where she became um, kind of a caricature of or of, yeah, there's I guess there's a there's a a line you can cross where where um, the the person like this, the the flawed character, um, almost becomes uh, kind of a folk hero, um, where they do all these bad things, but you're uh, you're so tied to them that you can't see any of their their flaws. And I, I guess the 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 thing I'm uh, like a Robin Hood sort of uh, yeah. you know character that was 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 that ever a line that you bumped up against and said okay now i need i need to kind of dial this back because because she's not perfect um no. we understand she has motivations and these things are are prompting her to, to do the things that she's doing but she's not necessarily a hero um yeah, how, how do you how do you go yeah. you know how do you navigate that line which is kind of the other side of the character um, yeah, I mean, I definitely didn't want her to be, you know, a folk hero. And I think that, you know, a lot of people, though, even though they root for her and she's their favorite character and they, you know, are inspired by her in a lot of ways. Um, I do think that, you know, she's still she's still doing the wrong thing. You know, her reasons make sense to her. But but, you know, the rest of us who are reading her story can certainly recognize the fact that, like, Meg maybe needs to get some therapy and she needs to (laughs) figure something else out as far as how to, how to move on with her life. Um, which I think if she were actually a real life friend of mine telling me, you know, this is what I'm going to do because he deserves it. And it's been 10 years. I would definitely say like, maybe, maybe, you know, you need to work on this, like, you know, but I think for, for the sake of fiction though, you know, which is where we all go to escape and live lives that we would never want to live in real life, um, it's the perfect place to go, you know, especially these days when so many women in the world are feeling powerless and feeling like we're going backwards um, as far as, you know, women's rights and and things like that go. Like, it's, it's, it's alarming and it's frustrating. And somebody asked me the other day, like, you know, are you feeling, you know, a sense of feminist rage that seems to be coming out in your books. And I think my answer is an unequivocal yes, I am. And I think a lot of other women that I know are too. The um the character of of Kat is is kind of the perfect um foil for Meg. And I don't know if foil is the right word, but she's she's a perfect contrast to her. Yeah. Um wh- where did Kat come from and and what was the process of of thinking, you know, uh, maybe these characters need to be linked. Maybe there there needs to be a a personal um, connection for Cat for it to work properly. It did, yes. And and for Cat, you know, I originally had her just wanting the story of encountering Meg or hearing about Meg ten years ago and pitching the idea to her editor at the L.A. Times and her editor saying, "No, we're not going to write that story. Sorry, it's not compelling enough." Um, and Kat just really knowing that this was her story, this was the story that she was meant to tell. Um, it didn't feel like enough, like, you know, to be waiting 10 years for something like that seems a bit of a stretch. And again, you go back to like, maybe, maybe Kat, like move on, like she's gone, like get over it and, and come up with a different idea, you know? And so I had to make it more personal. And so what I ended up doing was Kat, Cat ends up being collateral damage on a con that Meg pulled 10 years ago and Cat lost her career. She's now, you know, she's she got yanked out of the, you know, fast track in the newspaper industry for investigative journalism. And she now writes clickbait, you know, articles for blog posts and things. And, you know, she gets paid pennies per word and, and she hates it. She's miserable and she can't seem to break back in to the business in any meaningful way. 
and she believes that it's because she has unresolved business with Meg. And she also believes that this is the story that she can tell to not only bring Meg down, but to get her own sense of justice, her own sense of revenge to the woman who she believes was partially responsible, not entirely responsible, but partially responsible for putting Meg, for putting Kat in the path of somebody that traumatized her. And, you know, Kat is flawed as well, but at least she is self-aware enough to know that even though this is what she wants and even though she believes this is what she needs in order to move past what happened 10 years ago, um, she knows it's not entirely rational. She knows that, you know, she is probably casting Meg in a bigger role than is deserved, but it almost doesn't matter because this is the path that Kat has chosen and Kat is going to pursue it until the very end. Julie, you talked about um, how you envision the book in these three um, uh, separate stories, um, you know, maybe three acts, but you, you thought maybe they could be three different books. Um, when you started pulling all these elements together and, and realizing this was one kind of interconnected, cohesive story, um, when did you start thinking about uh, the the twisty nature of this book and the misdirection and the way that you would uh, play games with our minds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I I just didn't want the reader to be sure of anything. You know, when you're writing about a con artist, con artists specialize in a lot of misdirection, lying, um, you know, leading you to believe one thing when something else is actually true. And I wanted the reader to experience that firsthand. I wanted them to have that experience of feeling misdirected and lied to and not really being able to 100% trust what Meg was telling them. When uh, the, the the characters of Meg and Kat are, are such, um, you, you've got Meg who's this uh, kind of overconfident, um, she, she knows how to target um, people's weak spots and and to tell them what they want to hear right. uh, and then you've got cat who is who is uh, you know uh, full of self-doubt and full of uh, you know the, these feelings of uh, you know that, that Meg has ruined her life and and there's there's a lot of um, uh, self-sabotage almost going on there um, when when you started thinking about kind of the character traits of these two women, um, what, what was your process for, did, I, I guess what I'm asking is when you started envisioning these two characters, um, were there exercises that you went through to kind of establish who they were in your mind? Uh, or did they just kind of come to, to be fully formed characters as you wrote them? Did, did you know them fully before you dropped them into the story? Um, I knew enough of them to kind of know what their voices were going to sound like and kind of how I wanted them to play off each other, but they definitely changed and grew and developed into more three-dimensional people as I revised and, and kept working on the book. But that always happens. Right, right. The The last time we talked, Julie, was um, was right at the beginning of – of the deep dark uh, COVID era. And uh, I think we talked in May. And so I think we, we kind of had the hope that, you know, oh, this thing will be over with and, and maybe another month or so. And, and, you know, summer will hit and everything will be, you know, uh, joyous again. And that wasn't exactly the way it played out. Um, yeah. But, you know, you had a, a major book launch at the beginning of that period. And, and then, you know, it have written another book during that period and now, you know, launching the lies that I tell hopefully on the on the other side of that. But what was that period like for you? Uh, did, did you and your family uh, weather that OK for one? And, and how did that affect your creative life? Um, you know, we weathered it fine. We're we're a family of introverts. And so it didn't feel that different to us other than we weren't you know, we weren't doing the very little socializing that we, we do. Um, and it was nice to be home, you know, with the kids and stuff. I just feel like, you know, to have that time together when they were on the verge of, you know, being teenagers and leaving the house, I think will always kind of be special to all of us. 
Um, and, and my creativity was pretty much the same. I mean, my schedule was the same. I wake up early, I write in the morning, then I do my day job and work and, you know, and so it didn't really impact my creativity in the sense that, you know, it was, it was, I wasn't more productive and I wasn't less productive. Um, I didn't use COVID to push more hours of writing per day. I didn't feel the need to do that. I just, I, I like to work at the pace that I work at and, you know, it leaves a lot of time for me to think and ponder and rest and go back and look at things with fresh eyes. And I think sometimes when you try to add hours of writing work per day, you lose some of that space in your head that you need to actually move the story forward. You think that you're working and you think that you're being productive because you're working for more hours a day, but those hours are much less productive than they would be. Sure. Uh, Julie, if we know anything about the publishing industry, the lies I tell has probably been off your desk for for uh, a, a good number of months now and uh you know revisions that have have uh, completed and you know it's been in the publishing process for a while um what's what are you working on right now is it can you tell us anything about your next project um not too much about it it's a story of um a man whose brother and sister were brutally murdered when he was 15 and he was suspected of committing the crime, though nobody could ever prove it. And he grows up to be a very, very famous horror author. So it's about him and his daughter and, you know, the quest for what actually happened back then in 1975. Ooh, I can't wait to, to, yeah. to see what you come up with there. The Lies I Tell available everywhere now. Um, go grab it today. Go visit your local bookstore uh, or, uh, you know, visit Amazon and get the Kindle edition or... Uh, the hardcover or audible audiobook, whatever format you prefer, The Lies I Tell is a is a must have for this summer reading season. Uh, Julie, this has been so much fun catching up. Thank you for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you so much, Hank. It was a pleasure to be here.